Um, I should just point out that I'm the editor of the Independent magazine uh, and not the Independent itself, uh, if that's on record. Um, I've got my little clicker here. I'll just start by showing you um, this is this Saturday's edition of the magazine uh, and the Saturday that's just gone out. Um, I thought it'd be quite interesting to show you this just as a kind of a, a little lesson about kind of the weekly process of putting a magazine together. Um, we Obviously, everyone has been watching Skeleton at Sochi for the last few weeks, and we were kind of lucky enough to be offered in, I think it was about September, which is quite a long time for us, uh, really good access with um, one of um, Team GB's Skeleton riders, so we thought that would be great. At the time, she was number one in the world and was nailed on for the gold medal, we were kind of assured by her representatives. Um, if anyone is a particularly keen skeleton fan, they'll say that isn't actually Lizzie Arnold uh, who won the gold medal. It was Shelley Rudman, who, since we agreed to interview her, has uh, kind of plummeted slightly down the rankings and came 16th uh, in Sochi. So we rather cunningly didn't make that too clear on the cover. Um, I, just, I started on the um, magazine about eight months ago. I'd been on the Daily Features desk at the Independent before that. And um, I'd worked on a magazine, I worked on the guide at The Guardian. Uh, for a couple of years before that. So I kind of done weekly, I done daily, which is absolutely mental and breaks your brain and kind of was quite glad to get back to a weekly, which feels slightly luxurious, but um, I could kind of do with a lot more time, I think, because doing a weekly magazine, I mean, it's 60 pages every week, so it kind of comes around and we have quite a small team, so it can kind of blow your mind and you get to the end of Friday and kind of never want to look at it again and then you have to go and buy the paper the next day. And it's there. I'll show you, the, these are the first two we did. Um, when I started, we've, we've had a redesign, which was part of the Independence Hall redesign under Matt Willey. Um, just to kind of show you how it's, how it's changed, I actually quite like these two. Um, although the, the second one, I had a sort of long running battle with our fashion editor who convinced me and assured me that um, to celebrate the royal christening, because the Independent famously doesn't really cover the royals, the best thing to do would be to uh, hire the the country's uh, number one Kate Middleton look-alike uh, and borrow some babies and put them in very, very expensive sort of hot couture dresses and uh, see if anyone noticed. But um, I think we, we kind of got away with it. Um, when the guys asked me to talk tonight, they, I kind of said, you know, what, what do you want me to talk about? And they were, seemed quite interested in, you know, how you kind of go about putting a, a magazine together on a weekly basis and, and what the process for that is. And, I, I kind of had to stop for a second and think, well, I've not actually really considered, because it comes around so quickly, I, I, I've not really thought too much about what that actual process is. So I, um, one of my favourite magazines is um, Bloomberg Business Week, which is you know, sort of something that a lot of people who work in magazines say, you know, we love Business Week. It's um, art directed by um, a guy called Rich Turley, who used to be at The Guardian, uh, and its editor, Josh Trangiel, is a genius. But basically, they, they make business which you know, can be quite dull and it's lots of dry subjects. They, they make it seem very interesting, I mean, mainly through design, but also you know, they, they, they cover the right things. But I'll just show you a few more. These are on Cover Junkie, which is a great website, which um, kind of has covers throughout the, the week updated. Um, this uh, coming up is sort of my favorite one of theirs, and probably my favorite sort of magazine, uh, magazine cover of, of the last year, I think. I mean, it's silly, it's daft, it's about something quite dry and serious, which is mess, you know, the biggest mess shipping container boat in the world, but having sort of holy ship in 112 point font, I think is quite a fun way to do it. Um, and I, I mention this because um, basically the, the process of kind of going through and thinking about doing a, a cover on a weekly basis, because it, it, it's so quick, you don't really get a chance to think about it, but they have this great feature called um, the cover trail, which they have every week, um, and it's the first thing I, and I'm sure lots of other people who work, work in mags, kind of go to to kind of see what they came up with. I mean, if it's something, I'll just go back to this quite mad J. Crew cover they had, where they had Prince William and Prince Kate again, um, dressed in J. Crew, and just to sort of see how they, they got to that end product. I mean, this one's quite funny because, I mean, it's a conversation between Josh and Richard, um, and you know, just focusing on holy shit as a massive headline. Um, so I, that's. A similar, if kind of a better articulated look at, at how we do it on the independent magazine. Um, that's the end of uh, the cover trail there and their details. Um, just turn over. So it's kind of a little bit like peering over the shoulders of someone as they make it. And um, so I'll, I'll try and do similar with. Um, I picked, just picked a couple of our issues just to because um, 
And they're, they're not necessarily the best ones we've done, um, and I just keep sort of repeating it, but the, you know, the, the very fast turnaround of it means you, you, you kind of never are going to be happy with what you end up with. Um, so the first one I want to talk about, um, I mean, lots of magazines, especially kind of newspaper supplements, they do end of year specials. And I always found that they could be quite dry and quite repetitive and, and quite similar. And you end up, you know, with kind of pictures of the year or just kind of a straight review of the year or A to Z of the year. And I wanted to do something slightly different from that. Um, Oh, so this is just to demonstrate um, the influence, if that's a generous way of putting it, that the um, big ship cover. So Holy Ship had on uh, a couple of our issues. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to do an end of year thing that could become a kind of fun franchise that we, we could do each year. And um, I remembered when I was in the guide, um, we did this until the end of 2009, a very fun thing called um, The People Who Ruined the Decade. And um, it, it was kind of the most noise we made. I mean, I think the guide can sort of sometimes slip away a little bit, mainly because it's so diddy and kind of hidden, you know, inside the Guardian package. But it, it was kind of, we, it was very daft and silly, and that's kind of what we, we thought we did well. So we kind of had people, you know, kind of um, usual suspects like Simon Cowell, who we could kind of legitimately accuse of ruining the decade, but kind of daft things as well, like zombies and Michael Sarah, who got in there above Osama bin Laden. I'm not quite sure how. So I kind of I like the idea of doing this kind of concept that, I mean, obviously they can't do that every year because it's a decade, but you could maybe make it the year. Um, there's another one as well, um, which has sort of since been discontinued. I love US Esquire. Um, and they had kind of from very early on in their creation, they had a, uh, an annual in January, I believe, uh, called Dubious Achievements. And it, it's kind of a way of having a cake and eating it and, and covering you know, stuff that's happening in the year, but kind of moving it on a semitone or something. Um, another one that's great is New York Times every December do The Lives They Lived, which is a kind of series of essays and pictures and thoughts on people who've died that year. Um, the one on the left is actually James Gandolfini's Cadillac, and the, the essay with it was really kind of moving and brilliant. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be arch and silly, um, and I, I think that proves it. Um, I mean, obviously, it's about dead people, so it's not going to be wildly jolly. Um, so we, we came up with this concept, um, I'll talk a little bit about the cover in a second, but we thought, well, how do we cover the year, because we, we, we kind of have to do it, but what's a funny way to do it? So in about September or so, we, we, we started thinking, well, what if we kind of got the unluckiest people of the year, and, you know, instead of kind of doing something on the Pope, we do something on um, the Cardinal of Milan, I think it was, who was basically the guy that everybody in, in the Vatican said, this guy's going to be the next Pope, he's kind of the anointed one and then obviously wasn't. So we kind of did that and had the serious things. We also had slightly dafter things like badgers who'd been called or not been called as the case was, um, and uh, the beaker that was included in a quite a famous mum's net thread. So it wasn't just people. We did get a few cav I don't know if you can see it on there. There is a little caveat. We struggled a bit with the cover. Um, I mean, I think if we'd had, if we'd kind of thought about it a bit more, we, we could have kind of designed some kind of branding for the unluckiest people of the year that we could come back to next year, which I think we'll do. Um, we, we also tried some various, I've not got the roughs, sadly, so I can't show you, but um, we, we kind of did things like we had the, the copy upside down on the headline, we had some letters the wrong way around, but it kind of just looked a little bit more like, you know, this is the stupid issue rather than the unlucky issue. It's very diff we thought it was quite tricky to kind of capture bad luck um, just using words. My original idea actually was just to have Sideshow Bob from that episode of The Simpsons standing on a rake, um, but we couldn't get the rights to that, and there aren't many kind of wire images of someone standing on a rake hitting themselves in the, in the face. So we, we tried to do it typographically, and I mean, when I went back and looked at it this week, I kind of wondered why the G and the E aren't falling off if the U and the N are. So it, it still doesn't quite work, but I think the idea itself was quite a fun thing and quite a good way of approaching it. Um, I'll just show you the spreads inside, um, which, Again, because we've got Howard here from uh, the Great British Bake Off, who I don't know if everybody watches it, but he had his custard stolen from a fridge. <laughs> this big Ferrari. Um, sadly, he looks a little bit like a slightly chubbier Michael Gove, um, which isn't sort of great pictorially. So I think when we do this next year, and we've kind of got the whole year to kind of get good, unlucky people, we'll, we'll, we'll try and kind of improve the presentation. But I didn't want to sort of just show you stuff that I was really happy with, which isn't much, really. Um, we got um, John Terry, who 
got in his kit for the second time, having missed his second final in the year. Uh, Chris Froome, who nobody cared when the Tour de France. Um, and this chap, I don't know if you remember, he um, was accused of sending rice into Barack Obama. He was an Elvis impersonator, but was framed by another Elvis impersonator. So <laughs> it was kind of, it was a good way of getting quirky stories that, that might have been forgotten. You know, things obviously like the Pope that, that wouldn't be forgotten, but just kind of and showing our kind of mentality of how we look at things. Um, so it, it kind of worked, but I think there's a bit more on that. Um, I think we probably will do it better next year. And there's Dennis Farina, who died on the... Uh, there's Kate Middleton again. I didn't realise there was three in there. Uh, he died on the day their old baby was born, so unlucky him. Um, I'll speak to you about a second issue before I finish. Um, we, we kind of have a set rost roster of um, issues we have to do each year. Kind of we do a few travel issues, a few fashion issues, a few food issues. Um, and they're, they're, they're quite good fun, and they, they, they kind of allow you to focus in a way. And, I, kind of, I wanted to do a travel issue. We, we basically, the independent um, is, uh, among its faults, is very good for travel and has a weekly travel um, magazine called The Traveller, which has won lots of awards. And we have Simon Calder, who's kind of the biggest name in, in travel. And they cover kind of wonderful holidays every week. So I, I didn't really want to do that. And I didn't want to basically just send a load of journalists from D&D on kind of paid holidays that people might not necessarily be able to afford. So we... Um, we kind of narrowed it down and we, we decided that just doing it on trains might be a good idea, even though trains can be a bit nerdy. They're also kind of have been the focus of some of the best travel writing that's ever been done. Um, so we, I'll just talk you through the cover, how, what we ended up with. Um, my initial thought, as you may have guessed here, if you know Noma Bar, was to um, maybe try and get him to do something that combined trains and kind of holidays, which aren't two completely disparate ideas. Um, there's a couple that known as done in the last few years, the one when I was at the guide. Um, I was actually inspired by my deputy who was reading um, the, what can't remember what it's called, the one, the second uh, on the top. Um, and I thought I should include that because I hadn't realised until I was researching this that um, it was commissioned by It's Nice That. So uh, there they are. Um, so my art director, uh, Kevin Bayliss, he had an idea of kind of trying to create a train from a load of old maps, and uh, he mentioned a chap called Martin O'Neill, um, who'd done a few things for us before. One of them was this uh, A to Z of 2013, um, which we won't be doing next year because I don't like that kind of thing. Um, and basically, we said to him, Can you make a train out of old maps? Thinking, Well, that could be a bit of a fool's errand, but let's see what he comes up with. And so we we gave him a, a week or two, which, again, isn't a tremendous amount of time. And the next day, he kind of tweeted this, which filled us with confidence, where he'd basically been to a, uh, a second-hand bookshop and got all these beautiful old um, maps. And we kind of thought, well, that's interesting. They're going to come to a, a, a bloody end. And uh, you'll see, sort of not long after, he'd kind of torn them to shreds. Um, so we were quite excited to kind of check in with him. And he said, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll do it. Um, and you know, it'll work and we weren't, sorry, I'm drifting over here. Um, so we, after a couple of days, he came back and he gave us this, um, which I was really happy with. And I think is really sort of quite unusual and beautiful and striking for a Saturday supplement cover. Um, I would say that perhaps, but I think often illustration isn't used enough in them and you kind of, they, they can be a bit too kind of glossy and aspirational. Um, and we should perhaps do that as well, but um, I thought it was, the image ended up looking really nice and it was kind of the best thing I think I've done since I've been on the mag. Um, so then we kind of thought, okay, well, this didn't actually happen in this chronological order, but um, we started thinking about, well, if we're doing trains, what do we put in there? And um, I've, I've sort of been reading the Great Railway Bazaar by uh, Paul Theroux, and, um, which is sort of kind of known as the, the, the greatest bit of travel writing about trains ever done, possibly even the, you know, the kind of greatest book about travel, period. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll aim high with our low budgets and uh, see where we get. So I emailed Paul's agent and said, you know, we're doing this thing about trains. It'd be great if he could do something. And his agent emailed back and said, well, you know, he's on a beach in Hawaii, so probably not going to do it. So we thought, OK, well, that's... Um, troublesome, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. And then we had an idea which I, I kind of, part of the reason I wanted to talk about this is because it was quite unusual and um, 
if, I, I'm still not sure if it was the right decision or not, so maybe you know, someone could tell me later. Um, we kind of wondered if it would be worth speaking, going back to Wiley, his agents, and saying, well, what if we kind of extracted some of the Great Railway Bazaar, which came out in 1972, I think, and obviously book extracts are very common, but to go back and get something from a very old book, which a lot of our readers could well have read, is possibly madness, possibly a good idea. Um, but they were, they were quite up for it, and I, I, I kind of justified it on the basis of well, if you've read it, there's no real reason you'd be reading it recently. And if you are, there's probably only about two independent readers who are. Uh, if you've read it before, it's a great chapter. It's basically Paul traveling from uh, London, Victoria to um, Paris Gare de Nord um, back in the day when there's no Eurostar. And it's, it's a great chapter where you know, he kind of gets annoyed by various of the tourists. Um, and so we, we, we thought, well, let's go for it. And no one stopped us, so we, we kind of thought it would be good, so um, let's get that one. Um, so we kind of ended up with this, this package that opened with a big piece by Paul Theroux, and he also did a, a little interview for us as well, kind of putting it uh, into context and kind of you know, talking about trains in general, uh, and that led to us. So we, we kind of had that, I mean this picture's beautiful, isn't it? It's, I thought it was from about 1962, but it's from 1996, I think. Um, we kind of use that as a jumping off point to get people to talk about journeys that weren't necessarily completely joyful. Because um, Paul's definitely wasn't. He kind of has a crap meal in the buffet car and ends up in Paris freezing cold and sort of ready to go on this epic journey. Um, so we asked kind of some of our writers in house, like John Walsh um, and others, to, to talk about their train experiences. And some of them were some of them were jolly. A lot of them were kind of tales of being, you know, on the second bunk of a train going across India and getting puked on by, you know, a backpacker. Um, and I kind of thought that really is what I wanted to, I mean, it's not great for selling advertising to holiday companies, if I can tell you, but um, it's having stories in there that aren't, so here's Paul, I've got this picture of him, um, having pictures of, um, sorry, stories about travelling where it's not very glamorous and there is that kind of hint of romance of travelling on the train, I thought was quite a fun way to do it. Um, and we, we also had a, a really nice story by Manisha Rajesh who travelled India and travelled every train across India and kind of wrote about the food which you know was a bit more of a kind of a foodie piece more than a travel piece um, and Edmund Gordon got the kind of crap trans-Siberian um, there's two, there's a nicer one that goes down south and another one. Um, and we, we actually even got our fashion editor to um, go back and look at a sort of famous uh, Louis Vuitton show in, pa in Paris where I think it was John Galliano kind of took over an entire train station and in fact drove a train in and kind of had, you know, ev everyone there dressed head to toe in Louis Vuitton uh, with their famous baggage. Um, so that's kind of, that's two, I mean, they're, they're quite unusual for us, issues in that one was kind of uh, end of yeary, which obviously doesn't come around very often, and one is on a, a fairly strict theme. But I think we were able to kind of work within those constraints reasonably creatively. Um, and, I mean, I'm, I still feel like I've got a tremendous amount to learn, and I've sort of not been doing it for that long. Um, and kind of every issue I do, I, I pick up and hate basically when it comes on a Tuesday, but then I've made peace with it by Friday. And then three months later, I kind of think, well, that was all right, which is kind of what I've done with these. Um, I mean, the independent is, is quite interesting. I mean, we're, we're, we're not very well resourced compared to all the other national newspapers. Um, but that's not really a moment because we, compared to a lot of other places, um, you know, Riposte, for example, we, we, we have a, lots of writers and reporters kind of on hand the, the second we need them. So we're kind of working within limits in one way and, and, and not in another. And I, I think there's lots of scope for doing creative things and making more uh, good issues like these, um, hopefully. Um, I will finish there, but if anyone wants to tweet me or email me or get in touch with any questions, uh, do let me know. But um, that's it, thanks.